to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ we welcome you today to our Bible Question and Answers series. Today is our third installment in this series of Bible Questions and Answers, and we have some really good questions that we're excited about looking to the Word of God for the answer. I bet that you've had some of these questions even in your own mind. And so today, we're going to let God in His Word answer these questions, and we hope you'll stay tuned as we find out what these questions are. The first question in our Bible questions and answers lesson today is, is hell a real place of eternal torment? And there are a host of people who teach that hell is really not real, it's just a figure God used to describe separation or destruction, and that it's not real and we don't have to, if people die, they're just going to be annihilated and cease to exist. Well, friend, as always, we want to let God in His Word give the answer on this. And friend, here's the double-edged sword. If I say heaven is real and heaven is eternal, in the same breath and in the same verse, I must say hell is real and hell is eternal. What verse are we talking about? Look in your Bible in Matthew chapter 25, verse number 46. The same words used to describe heaven and its eternal nature is also used to describe hell and its eternal nature. Listen to Matthew 25, verse number 46. Jesus said, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That same word, everlasting and eternal, same word is used there, and they both describe the same idea. And so if I'm going to say, if I'm going to say heaven's beautiful, heaven's wonderful, heaven's real, and heaven's going to last forever, in the same breath, I must realize hell is real, hell is horrible, and hell's going to last forever. Jesus tied the two together uniquely in Matthew chapter 25, verse number 46. The Bible clearly teaches, you read the example of Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, and a lot of people say, well, that was a parable or a story. I don't know. Friend, listen carefully. That's not the point. Jesus never told a lie when he used a parable, did he? I believe that's a true story, and I believe the context and some of the indicators will reveal that. But someone says, well, that's a parable. So what? Did Jesus lie in his parables and use things that didn't represent reality? Well, of course not. And so when Jesus spoke about the rich man and Lazarus, torment, uh, unending, can't go back, got to listen to the gospel. All those things represent reality as it's going to be on the other side. Mark 9 verse 44, Jesus said, Hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Revelation 14 11, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. How do we deal with those ideas if we're going to write hell out of the Bible? friend to do so we've got to write heaven out as well because the same language is used to describe each and so is hell a real place of eternal torment yes the Bible teaches it and heaven are both real places that are eternal in their longevity and so that's a good question that has been submitted for us today and as always if you've got a Bible question we'd love for you to submit those questions you can email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can log on to our website thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and you can fill out a form and have those questions sent to us as well and we'll do our best to give a Bible answer to those questions all right, let's then move on to the next question that has been submitted. Someone writes this, I recently heard of someone being voted into a certain denomination to receive membership. Is this scriptural? 
How did people become members of the church in the Bible? Well, like, like the one who wrote this, I've also talked to and I've heard of people who had to bring a letter with them, who had to then go before a board of people, had to uh, review their character and things, like, and then vote them whether they want to let them become members of the church or not. Is that scriptural? Where do we find in the Bible that anyone is voted into the church? Well, friend, we just don't find someone being voted into the church in the Bible. The idea of men coming together, infallible, unperfect men coming together and trying to decide whether somebody can be a member, even if that's just a local congregation of that, friend, that's not found in the Bible. In fact, here's what we do find. And this is the answer to the rest of the question. In Acts chapter 2, we find how people were added to the church. Peter stood up with the eleven, and he preached the gospel. He preached that Jesus was the Son of God, that He was the Savior of the world, that, that God confirmed that with miracles, and that everything David said about the Messiah, Jesus fulfilled, and then He said, You with lawless hands have killed. And then he closed it by saying, Therefore let all the his house of Israel know assuredly, God's made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The Bible says, and they realized that. They were cut to the heart. They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We read down a little further in that text, Acts 2, verse 43 following, Those who gladly received His word were baptized. And notice... Acts 2 verse 47, having favor with God and all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were saved. Here's a stark contrast between what you find in religion of men and what you find in the church of the Bible. Men want to sometimes vote you in, say whether or not you can be in. It's not the way it worked in the Bible. When you obeyed the gospel, when you did what God said, God in heaven added you to His church, not man. Friend, isn't that a wonderful idea? If I obey the gospel, God adds me to His church. And wherever I go in the world, I'm a member of the Lord's church. I want to be identified. I want to uh, meet with other Christians. I want to be identified with them. I want to let them know I'm going to work with and worship with the local church in that congregation. But I'm a member of the church because I've obeyed the gospel. Nobody can vote me in or out if God has added me to the church because God adds men to the church, not men. And so that is a very good question, and it shows the stark contrast between the religion of men and the church of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's then consider another question that is asked by someone who has viewed our program. He writes, I have friends who take of the Lord's Supper once a month at their church. How often did Christians partake of the Lord's Supper in the Bible? Well, like the one who viewed our program, I also have seen places where some might take the Lord's Supper monthly, uh, others I've seen who would do it quarterly, uh, a big number of people will take it on uh, Easter and Christmas. How often, this is the real question, how often did Christians in the Bible partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, let's turn first of all to the words of Jesus to help us understand a little bit. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus here tells us about the Lord's Supper that's going to be in the kingdom. Jesus said, Matthew 26, 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so this was something that was going to be in the kingdom, something for the church that Jesus instituted. But how often did Christians do that? We know they came together to worship God, to praise Him. But let's turn our attention then to a passage that does tell us. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 20, and I want you to see the example of Christians in the first century. Acts chapter 20, I'd like for you to look in verse number 7. The Bible says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul 
ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. The disciples came together to break bread, representative of what Jesus said and representative of the Lord's Supper. And so when did they do that? On the first day of the week, they came together for the purpose of breaking bread. How many weeks have a first day? Well, every week. Did God mean for it to be every first day of the week? We open to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. And Paul gave orders to the churches of Galatia that they should give every kata, the Greek word kata is there, every first day of the week. And so they were coming together every first day of the week. According to Acts 20 verse 7, the purpose for that was to break bread as well as to give uh, of their means to God. And so here's what we find in the New Testament. Jesus commanded to do it. 1 Corinthians 11, there was an oftenness to it. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. 1 Corinthians 11, about verse 25 following. And the oftenness is they came together every first day of the week to break bread, to give, and to worship God. Friend, when we look at the example of the New Testament church, they met on the first day of every week to break bread. Where then do we find in Scripture that we're to meet monthly? We don't find that. Where do we find in Scripture to meet quarterly? We don't find that either. Where on Christmas? Or we don't find that. What we do find is Acts 20 verse 7. The disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Friend, if that was good enough for the disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shouldn't it be good enough for us? Don't we want to follow the pattern that they set forth for us? The Holy Spirit revealed this in the Bible, and we want to follow that pattern that the New Testament church followed as well. And so, you know, when we think about worship and we think about doing things the way God wants us to, let's make sure that we're staying true to the pattern of the New Testament and that we're not departing from the right hand or from the left. All right, another question that's been submitted for our consideration today. And this would be in conjunction some ways with our former question. The Bible says, one writes, Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Why do you teach that we should not keep the Sabbath today? Well, friend, the Bible no doubt under the Old Testament taught. As revealed in Exodus chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. There's no denying that for Israel, for those on Mount Sinai, and for the Jewish nation, they were commanded to keep the Sabbath. And so no doubt, Certain people in the Bible were commanded to keep that. The real question is, are we commanded to keep the Old Testament law today? That's the real question. We don't find command in the New Testament teaching us to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's not there. In fact, what we find is, worship God on the first day of the week. Jesus rose on the first day of the week. We find the, uh, the unique things tied to that in the New Testament over and over again to the first day of the week, not the Sabbath day. But here's what we know. The Bible teaches that the Old Testament, including the Ten Commandments, was the old law written to Israel, not for us today, has been nailed to the cross, and that I'm not living under the Old Testament. Where do we find that at? Notice a couple of passages in your Bible with me. Look in Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to notice what the Scripture says, beginning in Ephesians chapter 2. Look with me in verse number 14. The Bible says of Jesus, He Himself is our peace, who's made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in His flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Friend, this passage clearly teaches that in Jesus' body, when He died on the cross, Colossians 2, 14 and 15, when Jesus in His body suffered and died, He abolished, what's that mean? Took out of the way, did away with, listen to the language, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 puts, us, puts it this way, in that God said a new covenant, He's made the first obsolete. What is growing obsolete, Paul said, or the Hebrew writer said, is ready to vanish away. Is the Old Testament the law that I'm under today? No. 
We're under the New Testament that started after the death of Christ and will go to the end of time. Hebrews 9, verses 15 through 17. And so, why is it we don't keep the Sabbath day? The Sabbath was under the old law. It was given to the Israelites. It was a part of the Ten Commandments, and it is that which Jesus abolished in His flesh. Are we saying the old law is a bad law? It's not what we're saying. Are we saying that it isn't the Word of God? Of course we're not saying that. But friend, we are saying that's the old law. We're living under the new law today. Are there lessons I can learn about God and about life from examples in the Old Testament? Sure. But I'm not going to be judged by the words of Moses or the old law. How do I know that? Listen to John 12, verse 48. Jesus said this, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. What's it going to be, Lord? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Not the words of Moses. Not the words of the major prophets. Not the words of David or Solomon or anyone like that. I'm going to be judged by the law of Christ. And that's clearly taught throughout the Scripture. And so, do we deny that the Sabbath was a part of the law at one time? No, we clearly understand that. But friend, that's the old law. I'm living under the new law today. That's why we don't keep the Sabbath. That's why we don't make animal sacrifices today. That's why we don't tithe. That's why we don't offer incense. That's why during the month of October, I don't live in a booth, build a booth and live in it. Why? That's why we don't go to Jerusalem twice a year. Why? Because that's the old law. It's been nailed to the cross. It was taken out of the way, and I'm going to be judged by the new covenant, the words and teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right then, let's turn our, question, our attention to another question. And if you're just joining us for our Bible Questions and Answers series and you'd like to submit a question, you can email those to us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit our website thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and fill out a form and submit those questions to us. Here's our next question. I've heard people say that the birth in water Jesus spoke about is what happens when you are born physically into this world. Will you please explain the teaching of Jesus in John chapter 3 verses 3 through 5. Well, let's turn our attention there first of all, and let's read these verses together. John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 3. Jesus said, Jesus answered and said to him, Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Now watch this. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the person who asked the question is writing, saying, you know, they've heard people say that this new birth of John 3 verse 5 is actually when you pass through the amniotic fluid when you're born out of the womb and in that water passes over your body and that's the new birth that's being spoken of. I've heard a lot of people uh, myself even try to use that as a uh, objection to John 3 verse 5. But friend, we can know that's not true based on what Nicodemus said. In verse 4, Nicodemus said, uh, he said, Lord, I'm a little confused here. You just said a man's got to be born again. How's he going to be born again when he's old? You want me to enter into a second time into my mother's womb and be born? Is that what you're saying? He says, I know I was born once. You want me to be, go back inside my mother's belly and be born again? And of course, Jesus said, I tell you, here's what I'm telling you. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot be baptized. Nicodemus was confused on that. He thought somehow it was related to physical birth, birth and Jesus tied it to spiritual birth. How to be born into the kingdom. And so, what is John chapter 3, verse number 5 all about? Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, let's first emphasize this idea. Unless one meets these guidelines, he cannot be a part of God's kingdom, which is ultimately going to heaven. Whatever these things are, wouldn't you agree they're essential to salvation? Jesus said, unless, if and only if. You can't get in the kingdom if you don't do these things. So what does it mean to be born of water? We know that there is a birth in water that occurs, a death, 
a birth, a resurrection, and a rising or a birth out of that that occurs in the Bible. And it's found in Romans chapter 6. Listen to Romans chapter 6. Here's the birth, the new birth that Jesus is talking about. There is a death to sin. There is a burial spiritually dying to sin. And there is a resurrection or a new birth out of water. Listen to Romans 6 beginning in verse number 3. Paul says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so you've got death to sin. You've got burial and baptism with Christ, and then you've got that rising out of it, that resurrection, that new birth coming up out of the waters of baptism. Here's how Peter says it in 1 Peter 1 verses 23 through 25. We are born again by the Word of God which lives and abides forever. And so being born of water means that we've got to be baptized. Jesus said that, right? Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. 1 Peter 3, 21, Baptism does now also save us. According to Romans 6, Verses 2 through 4, we rise out of that grave. We're born again into Christ through the new birth and baptism. And then we're born by the Spirit because it is the Word of God, the Spirit's inspired Word, which brings new life in us. 1 Peter 1, verse 23 through 25. And so I know a lot of people have objections to baptism. Sometimes people, you know, because of denominational teaching, uh, believe that baptism is not essential to salvation. But friend, I hope you'll listen real carefully to what the Bible actually says. I'm not talking about what some book says or what some preacher somewhere says or, or, or what your parents maybe taught you. I'm just challenging you to think about with me for just a moment what the Word of God actually says. Notice these passages. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said this, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did Jesus say in that passage that you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved? Well, friend, if He did, baptism is essential to salvation. But then you move on down just a little bit to the passage we're studying now. John 3, verse 5. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Must you be born of water? Must you be baptized to Enter the kingdom of God. But come then down to the first gospel sermon. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Peter preached to those who wanted to know how to get out of sin. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. Friend, if the Bible says baptism is for the remission of sins. It's where we die to sin and we are spiritually born again. We come out of that watery grave, clean and pure. And we need to realize baptism is essential to salvation. And then you have the example of Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 9, Saul is told by the Lord, you go into the city, it will be told you what you must do. And Ananias comes to him in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, and he says, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, at whatever point in time, my sins and yours are washed away, and sin that separates us from God, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. At whatever point in time, my sins are washed away. That's when I can know that I've become a new creation, that I am pure and clean in the sight of God. And the Bible says in these examples, baptism is that point in time. Now, clearest language of all, 1 Peter 3, 21. Peter said it this way, Baptism doth now also save us. Now, think about that again. The Bible says baptism does now also save us. If God wanted to say baptism saves, how could He say it any clearer? We'd well, have to say something like, Baptism does now also save us. And friend, if the Bible says, now listen real carefully, if the Bible says baptism saves us, why would anybody dare say baptism is not essential to salvation? You have completely contradicted and are diametrically opposed to what the Bible explicitly says 
when you say that. And so, friend, we don't say that to be unkind, but because we love people, because we want men and women to go to heaven, and because there is a mass amount of error being taught on passages like unto these. And so, if you're not a child of God, if you've never really obeyed the gospel, we're encouraging you to do that today. Do you believe in Jesus as the Savior of the world? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to turn from a life of sin and repent? Acts 3, verse 19. Would you confess with your mouth the name of Jesus? Acts 8, verse 36 through 38. And would you do what they did in the New Testament to have their sins washed away? Would you arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord? If you never obeyed the gospel, friend, we're begging you today. Please, please become a child of God before it's eternally too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.